Hello there, it's Dr. Drake 63 Thank you for joining me today. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into maintenance and what you might consider a repair on a revolver today. And uh, this is going to once again be the Smith & Wesson Model 29 that I recently picked up. As you guys know, this is a firearm I'm pretty excited to get. And as you can see, it's in very good condition, but uh, uh, we did have to make some modifications to it. If you recall, it did not have the proper uh, rear sight assembly on it. And uh, in addition, uh, it's got uh, an issue, what I consider to be an issue for a 44 Magnum with what is known as end shake. Now, end shake is part of the overall thing that people will talk about when they're discussing a firearm as being locking up tight or not locking up tight. And what most guys are referring to is the degree to which you can rotate the cylinder, whether it's in a locked position or not, does it move a little bit. And um, most firearms are meant to uh, have some degree uh, of rotational play, and that's a good thing, but you get too much of it, and what happens is, is you can have your bullet actually coming into contact with the side of the forcing cone. You can get some lead spraying off to the sides and things of that nature, and then it becomes an issue. Um, but cylinder end play is a different thing altogether. That's the back and forth movement of the cylinder, which you don't measure by engaging the, the trigger or the hammer at all. You just simply see what amount of play it has. And I'll show you a close-up in a minute what's going on with this Smith & Wesson. Um, the only other firearm I have that really has any of this amount to concern is this Colt Trooper Mark III in 357, And um, I'll show you a close-up of, of it as well, but it has um, what I consider to be slightly out of spec amount of uh, cylinder end shake. And so for this reason, I'm going to have to be real careful how much I shoot the heavy 357 loads in this. Because what happens is, is you'll end up turning that cylinder into a hammer. Because every time you fire it, it's driving it backwards. That's just Newton's third law. And when that happens, it just continues to worsen the problem. The good news is, if you're a Smith & Wesson guy, and in my understanding this is also true for Ruger's, you do have some fixes that are relatively easy to do, relatively inexpensive to do, and don't need to involve a gunsmith. And I'm going to show you that today on this Smith & Wesson. Stay tuned. You can see before you a fairly normal um, gap between the cylinder and the forcing cone, okay? This right here measures uh, in the neighborhood of 3.51 thousandths, well within spec. But you can see that that opens up. And that opens up to about eight and a half, just shy of nine one thousandths. And I was able to determine that by using a feeler gauge. So. Both of these cylinder gap measurements are within spec for this firearm. That's not the problem. The problem is, is because you have this back and forth motion, at some point it's just going to get worse as you fire 44 Magnum loads, which are pretty stout. We don't have to, we don't have to doubt that. So it's something that we need to address, and I'm going to show you how we do that on this Smith & Wesson. This Colt... has a difference between the front and the back that's greater than the Smith. This is more along the lines of three one thousandths going out closer to ten one thousandths. Okay. And the problem with that is Colt doesn't work on these firearms anymore. You can't simply just do the fix I'm going to show you in a minute, which is using a uh, what's called a uh, a power custom cylinder bearing. You don't have that option. What you have to do is send it away and have it stretched, things of that nature. And that's an expense that's greater than I want to do. And it's something that I just can't 
fix easily on my own. Uh, um, I'm not worried about the actual where the gap's going to end up because it's going to be within spec. What I'm worried about is this cylinder going to hammer itself a larger gap and more cylinder end shake as we go on. And this is too nice a gun to let that happen. So we're going to show you a fix. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to unscrew this screw right here, which allows us to take the cylinder off. As always, guys, you want to make sure you have the right size screwdriver. You get something that's too small, and what's going to end up happening is, is you're going to booger up your screw and your screw head. You get something that's too wide, and it's going to scratch your frame. Okay, so the next thing we do is just very carefully take out your, your crane and your yoke, and here's what we have, our cylinder in all its glory. Until this needs a little bit of lube and cleaning while we're at it. And one of the things we want to be real careful of when we go to take and unscrew this extractor rod right here, it is a tube and it can easily be crushed. The other thing is that we don't want to mess up the knurling on the end here. Basically, my mocked up version of a pad advice a couple blocks of wood, a couple layers of leather and uh, we're going to slowly tighten that down. We're not going to go ape with it because we don't want to we don't want to crush that tube. That's hollow as I mentioned. So uh, one of the things that we were able to determine from our research is that this is a left-handed thread. So it's the opposite of the normal righty tighty lefty loosey. So we need to be real careful of that. We'll show you how we do that in the vise. The other thing I'm doing is I'm putting spent 44 casings that I'm saving for reload in to hold the ejector star in place when we do this operation. You can see how nice and flush those fit. That's when we talk about having recessed cylinders. Okay, so... So I've got this clamped down pretty good here. And what I want to be careful of is as I take this out, this is spring loaded. So I'm going to be careful as I pull this stuff off here. And as you can see right there, I want to be real careful with that stuff as I pull this rod out. And that's what that looks like right there. These Power Custom End Shake bearings come in a thickness of two one thousandths. I made a determination that I was going to add three to eliminate six one thousandths worth of end shake. They simply go down this tube right in the middle, put some rem oil on them, and uh, push them down to the bottom with the ejector rod. Works out great. It's also a good idea to add some oil to this spring and this rod while we've got this open. So, a little bit of rem oil will do. Okay, so we put everything back together, just doing the opposite of what I showed you before. And again, make sure guys, you just are careful, tighten in increments, use some kind of a padded scenario. And here, you know, no way was I gonna use the, the jaws of a, of a metal vise and screw up the knurling on this. So a couple blocks of wood, uh, a thickness of leather on either side, and um, that way we take care of stuff. 
and depending on what your your firearms made it may it may be left hand or right hand thread and you need to know that so we hand tighten this back down and uh, as discussed cleaned up and lubed the crane and the yoke and now we can put this back together and check it for movement this is the uh, appropriate name for this, Power Custom and Shake Bearings for Smith & Wesson KL and N frame. Here they are right here, going to hopefully go in my, not going to do much with these parts ever again bin. I wouldn't anticipate needing these again for this firearm. But if I do pick up another Smith or look at one that doesn't have serious end shake issues, um, it will be something that I'll think about. But what's nice about this now is here's a firearm that when I first looked at it had some things that would scare some guys away most notably um, that incorrect rear sight base which had its quite not attractive look to it and the other was a little bit of end shake now a lot of guys probably may or may not have noticed it but like I said I've got a little bit of, uh, of an eye out for that because of this old Colt here and I, I love this Colt. I think this is great. I love this Mark III so much, I went up and picked up the 4-inch version, which is in better shape than this one. It it also has zero end shake, um, like this Smith does now. There's absolutely no back-and-forth play on this whatsoever. And uh, that was a relatively easy fix. And it didn't really cost me much. These... Uh, Power Customs, you get a pack of 10 for like 15 bucks. You throw shipping on there, it's, you know, like 20 bucks. Um, oh, I probably spent more time setting up and worrying about taking shots with the video than I did the actual repair. So let's say about a 20-minute a, a repair job, um, I've got something that is in the state that I like it. I mentioned that this end shake has been completely eliminated, and I'm not kidding. There's absolutely no end shake now. And one of the things I was worried about being on the border between, do I use two of them uh, on a, on a 4-1000 solution, do I go for the 6-1000 solution, is am I going to mess with my head spacing? And from what I can see, not the case. She rotates just fine. And uh, from what I understand about these, these are going to get flattened out a little bit. Uh, as I start shooting 44 Magnums in these again. So here I have uh, a firearm that uh, is doing what I want it. And like I said, it's not, not uh, interfering with the firearm's ability to cycle through. And um, I also put uh, some, some casings in there to make sure it wasn't going to be a problem rotating because, you know, what we have done is effectively increase the gap to its maximum that was there already okay and i'll show you a measurement then in a little bit and we pushed back against the back here so does that cause an end shake problem uh, or does the fix of the end shake problem cause a problem with head spacing and apparently that's not the case but this thing has zero end shake it locks up extremely tight from that perspective has a little bit of that side by side side to side rotation uh, play that was already there, which I'm totally fine with. I've got it in a number of my Smith & Wesson revolvers. This, though, the band shake, was not acceptable. So we've been able to determine now that our cylinder to forcing cone or cylinder to barrel gap, very, very snug, very snug at eight one thousandths with zero end play. Smith & Wesson uh, will tell you these days that uh, a gap of 12 one thousandths is acceptable. Used to be in the old days, their maximum they liked was somewhere in the neighborhood of 10. And depending on who you talk to, some guys like it a lot less than that. I'm fine with 8 one thousandths. Um, when I did shoot this before, we didn't have any issues with... Uh, you know, lead splitting. We didn't have any issues with accuracy. Far from it. So, eight one thousandths is uh, well within spec. And um, given the fact that uh, these forcing cones, these big thick forcing cones, are going to like to heat up with a lot of forty four going through it, um, better to 
to err that way, if you're going to err anyway, then saying, well, I got to be at two one thousandths because then you're going to, you're going to hang up and you're going to bind. That's just the way it is. If you don't happen to have a set of feeler gauges like this, I strongly suggest you get one. Um, you can get them for, I don't know, somewhere around 10 bucks at an auto store. But I just want to kind of wrap up by saying, guys, um, if you are at all mechanically inclined, and I'm not trying to put gunsmiths out of work, but if you are at all mechanically inclined and you've got some dexterity and patience, you can see here with this particular firearm, I sent away for a couple parts from a couple different places, grand total with shipping and everything else, well less than $100. And I took a firearm that a lot of folks would have walked away from, and I now have something what I consider to be a very, very nice example uh, of the 29-2, which I think I told you in prior video that this was a 1973, and it was the Dirty Harry model. Well, it's not. It's a six-inch barrel, not a six-and-a-half. And we found out from Colin Smith & Wesson, per the serial number, that this is indeed a 1980 model. But it's still a 29.2. It's pinned and recessed. It's in awful good shape. And I've really enjoyed learning some new things about firearms just by uh, getting this guy where we need it to be. Um, I want to give some credit here also to Larry Potterfield from Midway USA. If you are to search on the uh, power custom bearings, or fixing cylinder end shake, you will see his video. That's where I got my learning from. And I would watch his. If I inspired you on how to perform this operation, great. Go watch his while you're at it. Um, he does a better job of detailing it than I do, and uh, he is a gunsmith. I am not. But this, is, uh, this has been a lot of fun, and uh, we've got really one more main video to do on this, and that is going out and shooting it. We'll get this to you soon. Now, I am going to be on the lookout when I shoot this to make sure that by basically, like I said, forcing this cylinder to the rear of the firearm and instead of, say, moving it forward, is that going to affect my timing? Is that going to affect anything with relationship to the function of the trigger, the hand, rotating the cylinder, things of that nature? But what we've done is we've corrected uh, what I think was a problem. Uh, maybe it wasn't a problem in terms of function today, but if I want to shoot this a lot, as I plan to, um, it's going to become a problem just because this big old cylinder on this end frame 44 is going to act like a hammer every time you shoot it. So hopefully we've resolved that issue. But I uh, want to thank you again for watching. This is DR Drake 63 I appreciate you guys uh, checking me out, and as always, thanks for watching. So long.